You're nice. You know that? Sure. I'm 100% wonderful. Okay. Don't believe me if you think I'm handing you a line. But you are nice. You're nice to be with. You're nice to talk to. There's nothing phony about you, Edie. Are you kidding? I wouldn't be here if I wasn't phony. You know the only reason I'm going out with you. Sure. You're playing me. You're trying to get me to do something that's crooked. If I turned you down, you'd drop me like a hot rock and start playing somebody else. Well? Well, there's one thing missing from that picture. You like me, Edie. And what's more, I like you. Look, I can't afford to like anybody. I'm in this to make a deal for a guy who wants to buy sugar. That's all there is to it. You still like me, Edie. Okay, okay, so I like you. It's not gonna do us any good. I've got a tag on me, Steve. There's a guy that owns me right up to here. And he ain't nice. Neither am I. According to most people, I'm the biggest, blackest, laziest, good for nothing in the whole town. If you don't believe me, just ask my father. He'll tell you what a stinker I am. He'll tell you quicker than all the rest. The manufacture and distribution of illegal alcohol is frequently a big business operated by racketeers and hoodlums who make liquor without license and sell it without paying taxes. Sometimes these gangsters require the services of a man who is engaged in a legitimate business. And sometimes, unfortunately, they succeed in making a deal with him. And now in my role as Chief Enforcement Officer of the Internal Revenue Service's Alcohol and Tobacco Tax Division, I'm going to tell you about just such a deal. A deal which, like an ill wind, brought nobody any good. This is Treasury File 4574, Alcohol and Tobacco Tax Division. The Case of the Black Sheep. You wanted to see me? It's about time you got here. I've been waiting over an hour for you. Can't you ever keep an appointment on time? Well, you see that? Oh, please. No more excuses. I have a little memo I've just sent out that I'd like to read to you, Steve. To Steve Mercer, with copies to all departments. Effective immediately, you're to be relieved of your duties as assistant general manager of the organization. Henceforth, you are to assist Mr. Wharton in the shipping department. And your salary is to be reduced to $60 a week. Is that clear, Steve? Well, except your reason for doing it that way. If you want to fire me, okay. If you want to kick me downstairs, that's okay, too. Only why write a memo about it? Why tell everybody what you think of me? Uh, that's not much of a secret, Steve. Furthermore... Everybody else around here feels pretty much the same way about you. And you know why? Because you made them feel that way. The first day I went to work here, you treated me like an office boy. Like you had to give me a job because I was your son. The first day you came to work here, you were three hours late. And you haven't been on time since. Maybe it does something to a guy to know that his own father thinks he's no good. Maybe it makes him no good. In other words, it's really my fault, is that it? I suppose it's my fault you flunked out in college, too. Got into all those scrapes I had to bail you out of. Oh, it, it wasn't really you. It was me, wasn't it? Oh, Steve. Steve, do you think I want it this way? Do you think I wouldn't be proud to have a son whom I could depend on? Who did what was right? Who didn't get into trouble all the time? Believe me, Steve, I'd be the happiest man in the world. Then give me a chance to be that way. Quit knocking me down all the time, even when I make mistakes. Believe in me. Once in your life, believe in me. I've tried, Steve. Too many times I've tried. If you want another chance with me, you'll have to deserve it. Thanks. That's just the kind of a talk I needed. That's what I said, Edie. I'm all set to make a deal. Okay, honey. I'll set it up for you to meet the boss. We'll get started on this right away. We're going to mix up a new batch at the end of next week. That means we'll need about, yeah, 4,000 pounds of sugar. 
You'll get 400 bucks in cash. EDOC, you get your dough and delivery. Now, here's the way we work it, kid. We pick up the sugar in our own truck. Are you listening to me, kid? Yeah. Yeah, sure. And what's the matter? Nothing. Nothing at all. Well, where, Putnam? That's what we've got to find out. Where this syndicate is making this liquor and where they're getting their raw materials. We can't concentrate all our efforts in trying to locate stills. Unless we can shut off their supply of sugar, they'll open new ones as fast as we close the old ones down. The way that Palmer outfit did two years ago. You remember. Indeed I do, sir. You know, Chief, I don't think I'll ever forget the chase they led me on that one. You know what it's like trying to find a leak in sugar, Chief. I could spend weeks just trying to find a lead. I think I may have one for you, Putnam. A lead about who's supplying this new syndicate with sugar? Perhaps. It may not prove anything, but it's worth investigating. What is it? This. The lab says it's part of a sugar bag, most likely the 100-pound size. Where'd it come from? And still, it was raided last night in Lawrenceville. Most of the place had been burned to the ground by the time Hubbard's men got there, but they did find this. This uh, could be quite a find. I'll go right to work on it, sir. All right, Putnam. Let me know how you make out. Starting with a piece of cloth not much bigger than a man's hand, Investigator Putnam began the long and arduous task of tracking down the company which made the sugar bag from which it came. And from this company, Putnam obtained a list of the sugar refineries and dealers who use this type of bag. It meant days of painstaking investigation to check the sales records of these organizations which sold sugar in large quantities. But by concentrating on the ones which had recently increased their sugar sales by an appreciable amount, the list was narrowed down to a dozen names. One of which was a wholesale grocer named Alfred Mercer. Now, uh, you say that your sugar sales have increased materially in the past few months because of these uh, new customers. That's right. But you don't recognize their names and you haven't checked their credit rating or bank references. Uh, these are all cash accounts. Most of them picked up their own orders in their own trucks directly from our shipping room. Well, did it ever occur to you, Mr. Mercer, that they might be buying this sugar for illegal purposes? What are you driving at, Mr. Putnam? Do you think I'd deliberately sell sugar to people like that? No, that isn't what I said, Mr. Mercer. All I know is that your company has sold 41,000 pounds of sugar in the past three months. And I want to know where it went. Every bit of it. Why not? Give me one good reason why you can't tell Marty the truth about us. I want you to marry me, Edie. I want you to walk out on all this and come away with me. Where? How, how long do you think it'd last, a combination like us? Just as long as we wanted it to. Oh, you'd love it, Edie. Just having a home of your own. Just knowing there's always a place for you. Somebody who cares whether you're out in the rain or not. Isn't that what you want? What do you want, Steve? A wife who's been booked six times for disorderly conduct? Spent three years in a state reformatory. That's not you, Edie. That's somebody you never wanted to be, any more than I wanted to be mixed up in a racket like this. You think we do the things we really want? What difference does it make, as long as we've done them? Can't go back and get a clean slate. Not after you've scrawled all over it. You only get that kind of deal the first time around. This is the first time for you, Edie. And for me, too. What about Marty? How do I get around him? You tell him the truth. You tell him you're walking out on him. I've seen what happens to people who cross Marty. What are we supposed to do? Sit around and wait until... What's up, kid? What are you doing here? Nothing, Marty. He just came to pick up his dough. I missed him at the regular spot, so I told him, come on up to the hotel. Oh. You know, that ain't very smart, Edie. He keeps coming up here to see us. Somebody's liable to get nosy and wonder what the connection is. Well, once won't hurt. Once is all it takes, baby, with the right people looking. Listen, kid. Don't you come up here no more. You want to make contact with anybody, call the warehouse. Mel will make all the arrangements. You got the phone number, ain't you? Yeah, sure. Okay, then beat it. 
No, wait a minute. Edie won't be paying you no more. You'll get your dough from Mel. What's the idea? Just a precaution, Kent. I got my own way of doing business. I don't like mixing it up with pleasure. You know what I mean? Yeah, I guess I do. So long, Steve. See you around, huh? Yeah. See you around, Eddie. want is the truth. Have you or have you not been mixed up with any shady customers who might be using our sugar to make liquor? How would I know if they were shady or not? Well, you take the orders, don't you? I take them on the phone. That's all I do now that I've got my bright new job. Sit on a stool and answer the phone. You still haven't answered my question. What do you want me to say? Yes, no. You wouldn't believe me no matter what I said. You'd think I'd done something wrong anyway. In fact, you'd like to see me mixed up in this so you could prove what you've always said about me. Steve. Leave me alone, will you? You know the way you felt when I walked in here. You acted like I was the biggest crook on earth. You didn't even ask me if I'd done anything shady or not. You just knew it. What are you getting excited about? Those treasury guys are always making some kind of a checkup or other. It's their job. To get names and addresses and copies of the invoices? I tell you, they know something. What can they know? You didn't phony any books, steal any sugar. Every one of those orders we gave you was strictly legit. And the company was paid in cash. But those names, Marty, suppose they check those phony names. Look, kid, you're new at this game. The least little thing goes wrong and you think it's a calamity. We'll lay low for a couple of weeks and see what happens. In the meantime, we don't make any contact with one another. Just in case they decide to play it cozy. Now, at least three quarters of these so-called new customers are nothing but fictitious names and addresses. This one's an old hotel. It was torn down about four years ago. But according to the invoice, 3,000 pounds of sugar were picked up and paid for in the hotel's name and signed for by a man named Jones. Well, I don't think there's much doubt but what the Mercer Company is involved in this in some way. Of course, there is a very definite possibility that those sales may have been made in good faith and that the company itself was being duped. And if that's their story, we'll have a hard time disputing it unless we can prove conspiracy. Conspiracy with whom? That's the big problem. Oh, I'm sure we can persuade the Mercer Company not to sell any more sugar to phony customers, but it might be a better idea if we let them keep right on for a short time and try and find out who these customers are. Well, I think you're right, Putnam. If you continue your investigation openly, you'll only frighten them off. Our best plan is to make them think that it was just a routine checkup and that nothing ever came of it. At any rate, let's be ready and see what happens. All right, sir. As far as the Mercer Company is concerned, the investigation is now over. For the next two weeks, Investigator Putnam made no further inquiries at the Mercer Company offices. However, the company's shipping department was kept under constant observation and all sugar deliveries and pickups were carefully watched. On the 16th day of surveillance, a truck driven by a man who did not work for one of the Mercer Company's established customers picked up an order for 3,000 pounds of sugar, an order which was paid for in cash. Immediately suspicious of the transaction and the apparent lack of identification on the truck itself, investigators Putnam and Knox followed it. The trail led from city traffic to a state highway and eventually to an abandoned shack where the sugar was unloaded. And that night, the shack was raided and a still which occupied the premises was destroyed. Answer me, Steve. Why won't you answer me? If this order you okayed yesterday afternoon isn't a phony, why won't you tell me who picked it up? I told you, the Prospect Candy Company. The Prospect Candy Company. There's no such place and you know it. But look at that address. 4821 Carter Street. Why, that's a cemetery out there. Why, that's way out in the country. Well, I, I just didn't check it, that's all. And why didn't you check? Why haven't you checked any of these phony orders that have been coming through? Why, Steve, why? 
Is it because you just don't care anymore? Is that the only reason? Isn't that reason enough? Don't you talk to me like that. After all, I am still your father. Are you? I thought you'd stop being my father a long time ago. Hello? Steve, what's wrong? No, no, I can't talk now. I'm expecting Marty any minute. Well, no, no, he isn't here yet. Edie, I've got to see you. I've got to get away from here, baby, and I want you to come with me. Steve, I know it's important, but couldn't it wait? Honey, it won't wait. This whole deal is going to blow sky high any minute now. We've got to be out of here before it does. Please, honey, it's our last chance. If we don't take it now... Look, there's a train leaving for New York at half past four. Can't you throw some things into a bag and meet me at the station? I need you, honey. All right. I'll meet you at the train station at four o'clock. Wait for me. Wait for who? You've been talking to that Mercer kid again, Edie? I thought I warned you about that. Well, I had to answer the phone. Never mind the alibis. We even got time for that now. We're pulling out of here. What? You heard me. We're pulling out. Get your stuff packed. As soon as we clean a few things up down at the warehouse, we're taking the powder. Well, why? What happened? Those treasury guys. They must be onto that Mercer kid. They picked up the truck. What? Nick's truck. They drilled it all the way to Bedford last night. They raided the still. They know about the sugar and everything, except us. Holy mackerel. That's why I didn't want you talking to that Mercer kid, Edie. He's poison. If they're watching him, he can lead them straight to us. Now get going. When are they coming, Marty? And why do we have to wait for them? I told you, I told you 15 times. They're driving down from Cincinnati with a truck to pick up a load of liquor. All we've got left. What do you want me to do? Just leave it here? It's worth almost 20 grand. But if we get caught, just stand around waiting for them. Oh, shut up. They'll be here. That may be them now. Answer it. Hello? Hello, Mal. This is Steve. Steve Mercer. It's that Mercer kid. Tell them there's nobody here. Get rid of them. Uh, look, kid. Uh, there's nobody around right now except me, and I'm awful busy. I'll call you tomorrow. No, I don't know where Edie is. Uh, look, kid. I'm busy. I gotta get downstairs. Why didn't you tell him what was going on? At least give him a chance to get away. Poor kid doesn't even know what the score is. That's too bad. We've got enough to think about without worrying about him. You've been worrying about him too much lately anyway. I've been worrying about a lot of things. After all, I'm the one that got him into this mess. So what? So I don't want to see him get in any more trouble. Go on, answer it. Yeah? Look, Mal, I've got to know what happened to Edie. She was supposed to meet me here at 4 o'clock. Will you listen a minute? You'll get us all into trouble. Let me talk to him, Marty. Shut up. Who was that? Who was talking to you? You're lying to me, Mal. She's right there with you, and so is Marty. Now, why would you let me talk to her? There's trouble, I tell you, and if anybody's listening in on this line... Steve, will you take my advice and beat it? No, you can't come down here. They may have a tail on you. Then you get her to call me at this number, Central 67598. I don't care. I want to see her, do you understand? And you get her to call me in five minutes. Otherwise, I go straight to the cops. Central 67598. and if she don't call him in five minutes, he's going to the cops. Well, where is he? Is that his number? Yeah. I told you to let me talk to him. I told you to shut up. That kid's gonna ruin everything. If he comes here, he'll drag the cops with him. You know he's being watched. Well, why don't you let me go to him? So you both can get picked up. As soon as the cops see you, they'll know I'm in on it, too. All they gotta do is look up your record, and if I get tagged again, it'll be for keeps this time. So what are you gonna do? I don't know yet. Is that the corner of Palm Street down there? Yeah. 
Marty, what are you going to do? Get her out of here, Mel. Marty, what are you going to do? Get her out of here. No, Mel, Marty! Marty, don't do it! Marty, don't do it! Steve, uh, this is Marty. Listen, kid, we had a little trouble down here. Yeah, we thought there was a cop outside. And... Now, look, kid, you can't talk to Edie right now. If you want to see Edie, she'll meet you right around the corner from the warehouse. Yeah, in about ten minutes at the corner of Palm Street and Ashland. She'll be there, kid. Right. Never get away with that, Marty. Won't, huh? I'm a pretty good shot, remember? And with a gun like this, it makes things easy. But it's crazy. What's crazy about it? I need the time and I need the dough. We gotta stick around till those boys from Cincinnati arrive. Anyway, we'll be a lot better off with that mercy kid out of the way. And this ought to keep his mouth shut. Downstairs, the answer should be fairly obvious. We've been looking for you for a long time. How'd you know where I was? Steve tip you off? Your phone calls tipped us off. You made the mistake of talking so long, we had them traced. Take them out, boys. With the apprehension of Marty Hinton, Mal Solon, and Edith Starr, the syndicate which we had been trying to break for almost six months was successfully terminated. Several other members of this syndicate were subsequently apprehended in a raid on another still in the same section. And a total of 17 men and women were eventually tried and convicted. Both Marty Hinton and Mal Solon received long-term sentences in the federal penitentiary. And Edith Starr and Steve Mercer were found guilty of conspiracy. Because of his record, Mercer received a lesser term. And so ended the case of the Black Sheep.